I would like to thank you, Andres, for the invitation. My name is Elhadi Jazeri. I'm associate professor and director of the Master of Urban Planning at uh, Topman College, University of Michigan. I'm also the founding partner with Rania Rosen of Design Earth. We live in an epoch shaped by environmental crisis and consequences at a planetary scale. And the talk today will think of the agency of representation of drawings and narratives in the, medi in the mediation of environmental concerns on how to make visible and public the climate crisis. The following slides are thoughts and elaborations derived from the first chapter of this book, Jew Stories and Other Architecture for the Environment. Why are representations important on the critical issue of climate change? Images matter for the Earth. The conditions of the current environmental crisis have relied on images and stories of industrial modernity, about the world as resource, about nature as external, about progress as an escape from nature's determination and limits, about technology as a quasi prime mover. Spatial representation is complicit in the perpetuation of such stories and myths such as this image from Total's promotional campaign with its binary and rigid symmetry between the Manhattan-like metropolis and a polar prospection landform. Such representation has erased something. It has erased the impact of technology on grounds, on the surface of the earth by constructing abstract spaces technocratic globes, managerial databases, how, hiding the unaccounted for tailing ponds, dirty pools, refineries, pipelines, landfills, camps, and the savages of extractivism, racism, and settler colonialism. Why does it matter whether territories are represented or not? When territories are not represented, the urban is confined to the morphological, to the administrative, uh, in a lineage, uh, in a representation lineage of Manhattanism. Such designed abstractions are efficient to contain, essentialize, and depoliticize the territory and do not attend to the politics of consensus and dissensus on how to organize and distribute resources. So when territories are reduced to a thin line, an administrative line, an abstract line, they are detached from their technological, geographic, and political attributes. In 1932, Hermann Sorgel presented Pan Ropa, later referred to as Atlantropa, in an exhibition in Germany and Switzerland. By constructing a dam over Gibraltar and dying up the Mediterranean, he proposed to attach Africa to Europe and make Europe more competitive vis-a-vis -vis the Americas and the emerging Asian continent. Technology and engineering were also tools to shrink the sea and the size and its size uh, to, to shrink the sea to the size of a lake and restructure its contours politically, culturally, and economically. It is, though, it is uh, through the control of nature that he claimed humankind would accomplish its destiny. A decade ago, the African resource imaginaries reappears again. AMO explored the possibility of a new energy policy in Europe in relation to outlined climate and security concerns. Roadmap 2050 was initiated by the European Climate Foundation to develop a practical plan to reduce CO2 emissions by 80% in 2050. Towards this ambition, AMO contributed graphic narratives about the territorial, political, and cultural implication of a zero carbon power sector resting on a specialized and networked region redefined by its energy sources. 
Ireland and the western half of England are the tidal states. The eastern half is, of England is the Isle of Wind. Former Yugoslavia is reunited as a biomass berg. Most of Spain, Italy, Greece, and North Africa become solaria. What are representations here revealing about the constructions of regions of energy? Well, the rendering Parisian energy from the Sahara sun perpetuates Europe's asymmetrical relation to its African hinterland. The rendering drops out the materiality of infrastructure and geography in which it is deployed. First, the large technological systems of solar, solar energy are iconized into a set of solar panels. Second, the geography is emptied out into a faraway tabula rasa. I won't comment on the camels. The status of solaria is particularly paradoxical in the project. It ensures the necessary kilowatt hours, all while raising issues of dependence and geopolitics. The diagram expands the scale of the energy network while maintaining that of the political body. North Africa is selectively added and then removed. Following, the, following Europe's energy infrastructure takes you to the Sahara oil blocks. Oil blocks are contractual and territorial demarcations leased by the central government to drilling companies. Sonatrach, Eni, British Petroleum, Equinor, China National Petroleum Corporation. For the purpose of exploration, extraction of oil, oil blocks are a network of spatial units or camps. They become by force of their aggregate extension and their long established function, significant parts of the territory. You can see the map here. I hear Giorgio Agamben cautioning us. We must expect not only camps, but also new and more lunatic regulative definitions for the inscription of life in the city. What is the nature of the ground in these oil camps? Government officials and corporation managers tell indigenous populations, you have to understand that when there are resources like oil and gas, in the ground, they don't belong only to the people who had the fortune to be born there. Land tenure and subsoil ownership are two entirely distinct matters. In the case of all camps, you have to resolve the following non-exclusive conflict, conflicting jurisdictions, that of the indigenous territories, the natural reserves, the oil concession blocks, and the administrative borders. Among Saharan oil blocks are the fields of Hasi Masoud. Hasi Masoud refers both to Algeria's largest oil field and the township that developed in relation to the hydrocarbon industry in the Sahara, added and removed many times, but always in the map. Hasi Masoud is very present in the map. It is Algeria's largest oil field and the township that developed in relation to hydrocarbon. As discussed, it is also a site critical to Europe's oil supplies. Beyond the binaries of North-South, Hatim Esoud makes explicit the transcontinental scale of technological systems of oil production from consumption cities to production uh, territories and landscapes, i.e. pipelines, pumping stations, industrial zones, roads, airports, security bases, dirty pool, tailing points, gas flares, and settlements. Although confined to an infrastructural issue, oops. I don't know what's going on with the images. The question of Hasim Masoud is clearly an urban one. The space of resources favors analogies of circulation. On the other hand, it requires fixity uh, and population settlement for its operations. 
It deploys buildings and land programs by which people attach themselves to the Earth's surface, occupying it firmly and permanently establishing themselves as, resi as residents with political, uh, political um, representation. The history of Asim Asoud is a manifestation of the contradictory relations of resource populations and security in the organization of the territory. It was established in the 50s as an industrial zone by the colonial administration and continued to be managed as such more than two decades following the country's independence. It is only in the 80s that its administrative zoning was changed into a township with elected assembly. Today, the, the town grew so much, including into the perimeter of oil fields, that the government classified it as a zone of major risks and launched the relocation of the town and its residents in a new town 70 kilometers away. The irony is the return to the zone. It started as a zone, as an industrial zone, a zone of exception, and it ends up as a zone, a zone of major risks. The urban question of Hasim Saud is enmeshed in the state's territorial priority with respect to both extraction and population settlement. Both projects are state uh, power, of state power aim at reproducing social relations in space. However, they project that contradictory interests in, in a place, they become contradictions of space. Would negotiation help resolve from fundamental contradiction contradictory interests at site of resource urbanism, certainly if only less lunatic regulative definitions for the inscription of life in the city were to be adopted. What is the agency of design opening up, opening up questions rather than, than proposing solutions? A geographic sensibility prompt us to think about the design of the territory, but above all to elicit us, and it elicits us to intervene within power and its re representation in ways that makes a difference. Design explorations. This is after oil. Um, a proposal of Design Earth for the 2016 uh, Venice Biennale. After oil proposes three speculative tales that explore the geography of the Persian Gulf and its islands in the decades after oil. These projects and stories also reflect a reflection of the oil sector today. They stage and extrapol extrapolate critical conditions of the oil landscape to make public, the public aware of the energy system on which modern life is dependent and the long-term consequences of current, fuel, current fossil fuel regimes. The project investigates three important nodes in the geography of oil systems, the extraction node, the transit logistic node, and the contaminated node. Thus island lie hundreds hundreds and 50 kilometers off the coast of Abu Dhabi. Since the first prospection exhibition expedition in the 50s, the island developed radically into a major zone where Abu Dhabi processes, stores, and export oil pumped up offshore fields in the Gulf. Such exports are a main state of the economy and the main driver of urbanization with many of the Emirates iconic buildings uh, built from and on the extraction of ground uh, and the resources and the transfer of its value to urban centers. Yet, the relation between the wealth of the surface and the poverty of the underground are never presented symmetrically. Thus, crude makes visible such displa displacement by collapsing the two sides. The drawing is both a timeline and a section indexing architectural landmarks to the geological depth and times of extraction of oil across three reservoirs. The project brings into visibility the hidden verticality and volume of the territory. At the end of after oil, thus, 
is not a reference to the period following the depletion of oil. It is also an exhausted site exposing the excavated volume of so soil and stone inside the earth spilled out. It is a built landform monument of the age of oil. The project reveals a race to the last drop of oil in the ground to dig deeper, deeper and build higher. It points out that the history of oil has been an ongoing effort to cope with abundance rather than to procure for shortage. The Strait of Hormuz is a critical oil choke point with 20% of oil traded worldwide moving across a 30 mile corridor. The Strait was never actually shut down despite of persisting anxieties about possible obstruction by regional actors. The revenue of oil futures perpetuate the geopolitical rivalry between countries on both shores of the Gulf. The project is a territorial board game, a hybrid of risk and monopoly. The Grand Chess Board repurposes the Strait into a real estate geop geopolitical and speculative game uh, between the local adversaries in the Gulf. Those who call it Persian in black, those who call it Arabian in white in the process, three contested islands get absorbed along the piece of, of speculative urbanism. Each piece is an iconic project from the history of speculative urbanism, Plan Voisin, Delirious New York, The Metabolists. Jew's story speaks to the meaning of speculative when associated with urbanism and as the domain of real estate capital and urban planning, as well as governments in many cities of the global south. In Bubian, the third and last project, we witnessed a significant change. If the end of the Gulf War in 1991 was accompanied with geotrauma, which was described by Werner Herzog in Lessons of Darkness, or what is considered as the world's largest oil spill, Bubian Island is put through another type of violence, a much more diffuse and slow in its effect. It is that of anthropogenic climate change. While the business as usual of the oil industry continues to increase the rate of carbon emissions, the flat and low lands of the island become more and more vulnerable to sea level rise. There once was an island gives form to the invisible threats of climate change, a series of vertical napkhas inserted into the 16 highest mounds of the island stabilize what is left of the submerged island. The project gives figurative shape to such formless threats for grounding processes of delayed disappearance, thereby making visible and comprehensible the gradual modes of environmental violence. After all, it's not a shift to a beyond energy regime formula, a time when the triad of energy economy and environment is at the forefront of design concerns, it is important to avoid that green urbanism purges dirty matters of the carbon geography. After all, is a call for reform of the geographic imagination. Design Earth draws on the geographic imagination to design with externalities, with the pipelines, with landfills, with the gas flares, to make legible the geographies of technological systems, visualize how they transform the Earth, foreground them as elements of design, and try to think about repair projects. Speculative architectural fiction, fictions become the methods to intervene representationally. Speculative architectural fictions become the methods to intervene representationally, to plot and give figurative shape to environmental threats, all while keeping the future open to possibilities of design interventions. Thank you. Questions for Hadi? I wonder if you have any thoughts you want to share on how your take on design earth and thinking that with, about the experience at the global scale connects to the scale of Fedville uh, that um, 
Absolutely. No, I, I think, uh, so this takes me back to my first slide. And the first slide really tries to say something about Redeville. So we can think about the ville, but we have to think about the resources that the ville utilizes. And the resources come from the hinterland. And this is the whole argument. We have to look at the re of the hinterland. So it is part also of what the city needs. Thank you very much, Kian. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, we're the mic for that. So thank you. Um, I have a question. So on representation, I think like you end with your point that speculative architecture and fiction keep, I, I think, the possibility is open, right, to interrogate further, perhaps envision a different way to do things. And I'm thinking to my own research in places like Jakarta, where the ability for Kampong residents to represent something in some ways um, equally political, but much, but, but in a lot of ways, it's more concrete. So for them, they say that representation make political, political objectives concrete so that policy action can Of, of what you're saying. And I wonder like, if you could bring these things together. Is there a shared representational possibility of project where uh, maybe activists who have not had the ability to represent so vividly um, work with you to Form, I, absolutely. So I, I think the first point is that if it's not represented, it's, it does not exist. It's not articulated physically, spatially, conceptually, politically. So this is the point of the drawing. This The horizon, uh, the horizon land, uh, line erases all of a number of domains that we don't want to see, telling phones, uh, pipelines, gas, uh, uh, flares, uh, things that are, or that have not been acknowledged enough, actually, actually in, uh, 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 recently with moder uh, uh, modernism. And if we put them on the map, we can, uh, we can act, we can repair them. So, the, the images that circulate are images that are desired or wanted by the people in power. Now we can put in uh, on the on the table other types of images uh, that maybe would allow uh, the agents that have not had uh, uh, the the opportunity to, to express themselves. We, they can put on the table other images, and we can we can discuss their concerns. So this is why the lower part of the map, which is you know, about the resources, the landscape that have been damaged by the extraction or by extractivism in general, need also to be on the table so we, we can discuss their concerns as well. So I think the, the virtue of creating images is not only uh, in the hands of the powerful, they can be in the hands of everyone who would like to contribute to the question of you know, the future of these lands. And here it's, it's really a call uh, for, you know, to, to use representation in a political way. Yes. They're really gorgeous to look at as well, and which I, which I think is important to get us to look at these things that we often really don't see and don't know that much about. But I, I find myself, I think, in this image, part of what is so powerful for me is that it actually, we're not looking at the oil industry. We're actually looking at the impacts of a whole lot of different decision makers, including ourselves, not just folks with a whole lot of power. Um, other than our power to turn the lights on and off kind of thing, you know, in addition. And I guess when I, 
the other images, I found myself though still sort of wanting to still see all of us in our consumption of energy as complicit as well. It's not just the oil companies or somehow represent, how do you get to represent uh, all of us? If not, if, not that it's just the oil companies. So, and, I mean, we are, we're, the oil companies are a huge piece, but I'm kind of, I guess that's the next step I want. I kind of found myself wanting to, I'm, what yeah, I, I, this I, image is doing Absolutely. So I, I think in terms of mapping or in terms of cartography, I, I, I think, you know, when we talk about, uh, you know, in the context of architecture schools or urban design schools or even urban planning schools, maybe we should look also not only as sites of consumption of energy, but also sites of production of this energy, sites of extraction. Maybe we can look at, you know, we can start to discuss, uh, you know, repair strategies and we can we can maybe uh, realize maybe the, the impact of you know, CO2 emissions because these CO2 emissions have been uh, allowed by you know, these sites of extraction. So I think just at the level of uh, you know, the architecture pedagogy, you know, there is still a lot, there is a lot to do just to acknowledge you know, the, uh, these sites that also are not very accessible. You know, some of these sites are camps and so, you know, you need authorizations to get into them, to take pictures. What happens in the camp uh, is not, is also a space of exception. Uh, Giorgio Agamben talked a lot about what, what you, you know, what were the limits of uh, these spaces in terms of human rights, et cetera. So it's not always accessible. It's not always um, easy, but I think uh, this is, it is worth doing if we want to, be able to have a full picture and discuss, uh, you know, the future uh, of you know carbon emissions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>